Uh, welcome uh, viewer to this segment, another segment of, uh, of modern beekeeping, which we call uh, apiculture. Uh, in, the in the previous segments, we looked at the modern apiary, and uh, we mentioned a few things. However, today I want us to look at uh, the bee family. In the previous segment, we talked of our colony, that the colony has got three types of bees. We have the queen, we have the worker bee, and we have the drone. And uh, I'll specifically today emphasize more on the queen bee. Because we only have one queen bee in our colony. And therefore, that tells us that it's a very important, important member of this family. So that's what we will look at more. But just to mention, uh, the queen bee, from the, when the egg has been laid through the larva to the queen coming into being, it takes 14 to 15 days, actually 14 uh, days. When you look at the worker bee, the worker bee takes 18 or 19 days. And then, of course, we have the drone that takes 24 days. So the queen takes, it takes a very short time to mature. That is from the egg to the queen, as opposed to the drone and the worker bee. Now, the queen lives for, uh, that is between four to six years. That is the lifespan of the queen. The drone lives between four to eight months. And the worker bee lives between four and six weeks. The lifespan of the worker bee is very short. And this is well explained because of the various activities that the worker bee does. It does a lot of activities in the hive. From getting nectar or pollen or water from nurs to nursing the bees, to guarding the hive, to scouting for new homes, to uh, <coughs> fanning the hive when it's very hot, they have to keep the hive at a certain temperature. If the hive is very cold, they have to again come together and raise the temperature of that particular hive. So that's why the lifespan of the worker bee is very short. The lawyer, the, 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 the queen lives longer Basically because it feeds on a very special substance that we call the royal jelly. Actually, the royal jelly is one of the six products that we get from the bees and very expensive. Royal, as, it go, as the name goes, it is meant to be eaten by the queen, not anybody else. And an egg, right when the egg has been identified, has been put in the queen cell, we'll talk about the queen cell, that larva is fed on the loyal jelly. This loyal jelly transforms that egg or that larva into a queen. In that, it, 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 the, the body is made in a way that it can lay eggs, both fertilized and, and unfertilized. Now, uh, let us now look at the queen. And as we have said, the queen lives between four to six years. The queen lays up to 2,000 eggs each single day. What that means, if you do your quick calculations, it means that the queen lays one egg after every 43 seconds. That is a healthy queen. And that is what it does. There has been a notion that some people have, or others have, that the queen controls, and ideally we believe that the queen controls the hive. To the contrary, again the queen may not control the hive. The hive is controlled by the worker bees. Because that's when, when the queen lays 
in the eggs the eggs in their cells the workers decide to form not on the instructions of the queen they decide to form the queen cells when the queen comes and encounters the queen cell it then goes ahead and lays the fertilized egg if it's not the queen cell it lays the unfertilized egg and the unfertilized egg is the one that transformed transforms into a drone a fertilized egg will transform into a queen or a worker bee therefore from the the way the cells have been constructed by the worker bees they will dictate the queen on which egg to lay whether fertilized or unfertilized and therefore the workers also can decide to kill the queen especially if the if the queen becomes unproductive the worker bees may kill the queen and form another different queen so in such a scenario is it the queen or the worker bee that is in control of the hive if they kill the queen or if the queen is eliminated from the hive they have to find another new queen that is the one i'm talking about the worker bees will identify an egg once they identify this egg a special that is less than 3 days they will feed it with 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 with, with loyal jelly such that it transforms into a queen after 14 days now it becomes a queen that egg that has been fed on the loyal jelly that now has become a queen the queen now comes out of that queen cell what happens they may form a handful of other queens when there's no queen in that in, in that hive the worker bees may may create several queens when they create the several queens now here is the trick because there can only be one queen in a hive or in a colony the queen that comes out first it moves out moves around the hive finds if there is any other queen if it realizes that there are other queen cells and there are other queens that are yet to come out the queen that has come out first kills all these other queens and therefore it remains a single queen once this has happened and it's important to note that from the time we don't have a queen or the the, the hive is queenless to the time it acquires another queen it takes a period of 29 days Now when this queen has killed any other potential queen that was to hatch now it takes what we call the nuptial flight the nuptial flight now this is the time when the queen goes out it moves out of the hive goes to an area where there are other drones or where there are where there are drones for the purposes of mating the queen only mates once in her lifetime with the drones actually it's not a drone it's several drones and it's important also to note that they met in the air and when that happens in the air once a drone has met with the with the with the queen it dies now if that drone does not die and finds its way to the hive the queen uh, the, the worker bees will eject that drone from the hive why because it has outlived its sole purpose the sole purpose of the of the drone is to mate with the queen and if by any chance that drone survives it is never allowed back to that hive and therefore it will stray and die now the mating process is done by a virgin queen the queen once it gets out it goes and mates with the, with with several males uh, of course in that flight and after an ejaculation as we have seen from that drone it dies the virgin queen only attend to one mating flight only once in its lifetime that one uh, I, i have already, already talked about it 
Now, what happens? What happens when it, it has moved out, met with the, with, with the drones? What happens? The queen stores up to 100 million spams in her oviduct. It stores the spams for her entire life. And therefore, once it has done that, it uses the spams to fertilize the eggs. As I'd mentioned, that there are different egg cells. These egg cells, now they dictate the queen on which egg to lay, whether it's fertilized or unfertilized. The, the worker bees are very many in the hive. They are in, terms, they, they are in tens of thousands because a hive can have between 10 to 80,000 bees. The, the drones are in hundreds. And of course, we have one drone, one queen. And therefore, if the, 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 the egg cell is made in a way that it dictates the queen that here we need a fertilized egg, that's what the queen will do. The queen will drop a fertilized egg. It will drop an fertilized egg depending on the instructions or on how the egg, has be, or the, the egg cell has been constructed by the worker bees. And as, 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 as we had talked earlier, a fertilized egg forms a worker bee or a queen. The unfertilized egg forms a drone. And therefore, the unfertilized eggs or the fertilized eggs become the, uh, they can form or they can make uh, the, the, the worker bees. Worker bees do not mate. Worker bees do not mate with the drones. However, worker bees can lay eggs. But the eggs, because they have not met with the, with the drones, the eggs that they lay are not fertilized. That tells us that if a queen dies, and the worker bees do not manage to have to have an, an, an egg that were a fertilized egg and then feed it with the loyal jelly and turn it into 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 a queen. Worker bees can lay eggs, but they will lay unfertilized eggs. When they lay unfertilized eggs, then what that means is that they will have we will have drones. Because drones are the ones that are hatched out of unfertilized eggs. Thank you, Viwa. We have talked about the, 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 the queen and the, the worker bees and the drone. Now, in our next segment, we will look at another aspect of beekeeping. It's very important that as you venture into beekeeping, into the modern way of beekeeping, you must understand the bees, their biology, who they are, how they are created, and how they behave in such a way then it will help you to know how to manage your hive. You will know when the queen is there and when the queen is dead. You will know that this queen is strong or it's not. The queen will determine the nature of the hive, whether it will be a strong colony or a weak colony. A queen, if it does not lay between 1,500 to 2,500 eggs in a, in a day, then that means that you have a very weak colony that may not give you uh, returns, especially in production of honey. Thank you so much. Uh, welcome, viewer, to this episode uh, on beekeeping where we provide information, statistics, analysis on the trends of beekeeping in Kenya. According to the, modern, to the current report, we find that Kenya produces 7,300 tons of honey annually, against a potential of 100,000 tons. What this means is that we have a huge gap uh, in terms of honey production. And again, the honey produced in Kenya meets only 20% of the market. Where do we get the rest of the honey from? We import it from Tanzania, which actually is also lagging behind in terms of production, uh, from Ethiopia, 
and these other countries. And actually, this gap has necessitated uh, to the issue that we have now adulterated honey. Nowadays, our people, especially in Kenya, do not trust the honey market. Why? Because there is a lot of adulterated honey. This is because the production is very low. Now, I want to give you a few uh, insights uh, on beekeeping. Initially, we were looking at beekeeping as a, as a way or as something that was practiced by the old people in the villages. Where there are these traditional hives, which we call the log hives, put somewhere in the forest, and then uh, they will go there, harvest, get a one kilo or two kilos, just for home use. But now, we are making a generational change in manners or in the way that we do beekeeping. For instance, beekeeping is a profitable venture. How is it profitable? You buy one hive, and in Kenya, one hive will cost you between 5,000 to 7,000 shillings. That hive is likely made from, a good, from good timber or material. It will last for 15, 10 to 15 years. And that hive will give you 10 to 15 kilograms of honey per harvest. A kilogram of honey uh, in, our, in, our, in our local markets retails between 800 to 1,300, depending on, the, on, on, on your location. So what that means is that once you buy a hive at 5,000, say, let's say 5,000, then one harvest, you harvest 10 kgs, that means that you have 10,000 from 5,000. And the beauty about, uh, about beekeeping is that it is stress-free. You do not have to be there to wake up your bees, to go out and look for nectar, go out and look for pollen, go out and look for water. What you only do is get your hive, get it well managed, as we are going to show you in our now series uh, on trainings about beekeeping. Once your hive is maintained very well, after three months, you will come and harvest 10 kgs. Get your 5,000, the capital of 5,000, you remain with 5,000. Now, a year you can harvest, depending on the locations where you are, you can harvest three to four times. So you can do your math that this hive that you put at 5,000, you've harvested three times in a year, it has given you 30 kgs. 30 kgs, that is 30,000. Therefore, you get your 5,000 that you spent, you have 25,000 as your profit. And this hive is going to stay for 10 to 15 years. Now, that is the beauty about bee farming. Another issue that is bringing the generational change is that we are not doing the traditional ways of beekeeping. What that means is that we have, you don't need a very big piece of land. As you can see behind me, is a new apiary that we've set up. This apiary is going to carry more than 100 hives. What is the size of this apiary? The space for 100 hives is very small. Maybe around 30, 30 meters by 15 meters, you know, as you may want to design it. So a small space, a small piece of land, you can have your apiary there. And bees are not as hostile as people think. Bees will only be hostile if you have intruded, if you have disturbed them, the bees then now will attack to defend themselves. Otherwise, as you can see behind me, we are uh, within the area, we have eight hives here, all of them which have, high, have, have bees, but you can see the distance. We are just around and we are doing our stuff as they are also doing their stuff. So beekeeping is a very profitable venture. You buy your hive, set it there, let the bees come in, ensure it there's around that place. Uh, the place is very clean. There are no termites, there are no safari ants. You come and harvest. You don't have to buy uh, pesticides. You don't have to, in, in, in short, what we are saying is that the cost of production is nil. The only cost that you incur is to come and harvest. So otherwise, beekeeping is a very profitable venture. Now, we, 
are here to show you various aspects on beekeeping. Miller's Bee Nexus will bring you these episodes on beekeeping, this training wherever you are, such that you learn from scratch to a point that you are harvesting. Now, the first thing that we've done to factor in safari, safari ants and any other rodents that may encroach into the apiary, we have constructed a trench. Now, this trench, we've put some water in it. This water serves two purposes. One, it can serve as a barrier to the safari ants, to the crawling insects that may get into the, into the apiary that may disturb the, the, the bees and subsequently experience uh, bees absconding. This water also acts, if, if, if you can see, we've put some floaters. These floaters, this water, the bees also use it for their own use. Therefore, what that means is that our bees do not have to travel long distances in search of water. Now, what they have to travel to search for is pollen and nectar, but the water is here. Then, for security purposes, we've used a chain link uh, that we have put around it. And then uh, we have, because of the space, to maximize the space, we have put two levels inside. As you can see, we have the lower compartment where we have two levels. And then, of course, we have the upstairs compartment. In the stairs up. And as you can see, there's a lot of space. You can see the beds. I'm able to work comfortably because what we factor when we are building a new hive is that you must work with a lot of ease. There's a lot of space. I'll harvest here. We are going to put more hives down here. I'll pull them out, do the harvest, move to the next hive. So 200 hives. If you touch, let's say 50 hives, the bees that will be out are very many. So we have made this place or this apiary as comfortable as it can be for harvesting. So then, assuming I've entered from here, as I do the harvest, I'll be moving out because these bees, as you touch these bees, some of them will find their ways to the walkway. And when they find their ways to the walkway, and these ones, when you pull them out and you're harvesting them here, some bees will be on the ground. So if I go and then come back, I may step on these bees. So this apiary has been designed to also make the bees comfortable and we do not have a lot of fatalities during harvesting. Therefore, I'll harvest then move to the next hive, the other hive, another hive, another hive, and once I'm done with the harvesting, then I'll get out through the other exit that we have. So we have two points of exit or entry. As you enter to, from the other, uh, as you come in, now you walk out through this one. Basically, because of comfortability, and to mind the bees that we do not have a lot of apiaries. So this is apiary number two for Miller's Bee Farm. And let us see how it grows. We have brought in hives. From here, we are going to set up. We are going to set up some hives. We are going to trap some bees. We will show you how we are going to do it. So in the next segment, we are taking you now into the hive. Continue watching and following us on Twitter, on Facebook, on uh, Boresha platform, on YouTube channel for this and much more on beekeeping. Thank you so much. Now I want to give a simple explanation of the best hive or the hive that is commonly used by beginners. And this hive is the one that is uh, in front of me which we call the Langstroth Hive. Langstroth Hive uh, was an invention of a man or of an American called Lorenzo. He came up with the invention. He was an apiarist, an American apiarist. And his innovation of the Langstroth Hive, which is called or is named after him or after the inventor, has lived the test of time because it has lived to the expectations of the farmer. And therefore, it is 
one of the most uh, types of hives that are used in the modern apiculture. But of course we have other hives like the log hives, the traditional hives that we normally have uh, deep in the villages here in Kenya. Then of course we have the Kenya top bar hive which has also uh, been used widely not only in Kenya and Africa but in the world over. And now we look at the Langstroth hive which is very good, which gives us good yields especially in honey production. And therefore uh, what I'm going to do, I'll explain briefly on how this Langstroth is and how it behaves and how we are going to install it. With me here, we have one of the best uh, baits for bees that we use here in Kenya and Africa. And I'm going, I'll show you how we are going to use it shortly. So this is the Langstroth hive. The Langstroth hive has got three compartments. And they are the ones that I'm going to show you now. This is the cover. It covers the, the top of the hive. So after you remove this cover, I'm going to place it here. After you remove this cover, we have another, another section, this one. Now this one, which we put at the top, we call it a super or super box or honey super. It is the one that we place here. And this is the one that where, this is from here is where we normally harvest. And as you can see, when harvesting, it has frames. We have supers or Langstroth hives that have nine, nine frames. But the one that we are using today has got 10 frames. And I'm going to explain how they work. So after the super, we have this mesh. It can be made out of plastic or anything else, but provided it has small holes uh, that only worker bees can go through, which is placed right here in between the super and to the next compartment that we call the brood box or the lower box. The brood box is where it also has 10 frames or nine frames, depending on the design that you've the, 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 the carpenter has decided to use. And this, it is of the same size, the brood box is of the same size with the super box. So now, what I'm going to do, I'm going to explain how you install it. Now, when bees come, of course, and right away, I'm going to install this hive. So what we do, ensure that the hive is very clean. These are the frames, as you can see. Bees do not like a place that is unclean. You know, even when they come, they will clean the hive. If there are other worker bees that die in the hive because of one reason or the other, it could be because they have, their time has come and they die or when you're harvesting and maybe some honey has dropped and the, a, a, a bee is stuck in that honey and it dies the bees or the worker bees will clean the hive they throw everything outside anything that is not wanted in the hive they throw it outside and therefore we have to make this hive as clean as we can we remove all the dirt You can use a brush, ensure that the, the hive is clean, open the entrance. This hive has a very good entrance. The beauty of this is that it has been made in a way that it will guide the bees on how to build their comb. So we have the starter comb here, which is the wax. This wax will help the bees to start their comb, building their comb. That's why we call the starter comb. And again, at the same time, because it is wax, when it is in the hive, it also attracts bees or the scout bees when they are coming, when they are looking for a new home. This, the smell itself will attract new bees to come in. Now, we will put back 
uh, the frames. We have ensured that the hive is clean. Get a brush or something that you think will help you clean it better. So we pull them back. We said we have, this is a 10 frame uh, Langstroth hive named after the inventor, Lorenzo Langstroth, who was an American teacher and a clergyman and a man who contributed immensely in the beekeeping industry or in the bee farming to date. That's why you see uh, this hive has lived the, the test of time. Now, because we are going to install this hive, we are going to use one of the best, one of the best baits uh, in bee farming, which we call the lemongrass oil. If you've been hearing about lemongrass oil, this is it. And it's one of the best baits for the bees. Just a drop of it. I'm using this because I don't want to waste to waste this. If you see this, this can serve around 20 hives. And therefore it's just a drop. If we stay here a little bit, you will start seeing uh, scouting bees coming here. So after we've done this, we can decide to put our queen excluder. This is our queen excluder. Now the work of this queen excluder is that when we put it here, we cover at the top. The queen bee has come in. The worker bees are there. So the queen, if you've looked or studied the queen, how it looks like, it looks like, it looks like the size, it is a bit bigger. And therefore, the queen, a well-fed queen, cannot go through this mesh. And therefore, it cannot lay eggs on the upper chamber. The lower chamber, the brood box, is where the queen is going to stay. The only creatures that are coming up here or type of a bee is the worker bee. And its work is going to come up. Once they have built down, they have finished, they need to store their food, which is honey. Now they will pass. Once, the low, once this lower chamber is full, the queen bees will, I mean the worker bees will find their way up, look for more space where they are going to put their honey. And now that is the work of the super, what we call the honey super. Now we will put it here. So now what is going to be here at the top when we are harvesting is honey. Then when we have put this, we will bring our cover and put it back. So that is the Langstroth Hive for you. But how are we going to install it? Now, <clears throat> before the bees get in, what we are going to do, we are going to remove the honey super. We will remove the honey super and then cover the brood box only which we are going to use in this case as our catcher box we are not going to take this the way it is without bees to our apiary what we are going to do we are going to place it somewhere a raised place for the bees scouting bees to come when they enter when they come in we will take like two to three days and then now we move it to our apiary so why we are moving the top cover the reasons are simple. One, for portability issues. For us to be able to carry it to a raised place, we remove the super box. That is point number one. Point number two, when the bees are going to come in, remember, they don't have brood. They have not constructed anything. They could be fewer in number and they have to keep the hive at a given temperature for the eggs to hatch and for the queen to lay eggs. And therefore, we do not want to give them a lot of work. We have to make the space that they are living in as small as possible for that warmth. Because we want them to work very fast, the hive should, be, should give them enough warmth such that more worker bees should get out, get in pollen, get in nectar, and work as effectively as, as it should be. 
If that is not the case, especially in, in, uh, in cold seasons, most of the worker bees are going to remain in the hive to keep the hive warm or to keep it to the temperature that is required. And remember, if the hive is very hot, most of the bees will get out. If the hive is very cold, the bees will be in the hive to keep it, to keep it hot or warm. If it's, if it's hot, some, hive, some bees will be inside and they will be trying to fan the hive to keep it at that particular temperature. So we want them to work at the optimum. And therefore, that's why we are going to take the brood box, use it as our catcher box until we have new bees that are coming in. When they come in, we are not going to put the super, bo the, 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 the super back until the bees have constructed, they have put brood, they have put their hive combs, their, their, their combs into seven or eight frames. Once seven or eight frames have been filled, then now you can bring back the super box. Give them space to start constructing because the bees will be uh, uh, will have a good number. We give them a lot of space, and then they start now constructing the super box, ready, making it ready for the farmer to smile, because there then it will be only honey. And therefore, when we are going to harvest the brood box, in the next segment, we are taking you to the apiary this evening, as we are going to harvest, and you see how honey, a lot of honey will be here. This frame is supposed to give us 1 to 1.5 kgs times 10 frames. You know what that means. Thank you, viewer. Continue subscribing and watching for more lessons on apiculture. Thank you. May God bless you. Now, let us look at the various products that we get from the bees. Most people or many people uh, know honey or perhaps and one other honey and wax as the products that we get from the bees. Now we have six products that we get from the bees. The cheapest one that I'll start with is honey. We have honey and honey is the food meant for the bees. And as I always say, we go and steal that food meant for the, for, for the bees. In a more detailed uh, perspective, you will see the various components that bees, when they make honey, they use various flowers. And you know that you can go to the hospital and you are told take honey, you know, and so on and so forth. Honey does not go bad. Honey can stay even up to 400 years. So that is the first product. And you know how it is being used. We can use it as a sweetener. We can use it as food. We can use it as medication. Uh, it's an anti-inflammatory, you have a cough, you take a, 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 a tablespoon of honey and, and the cough goes away. So it has that medicine of value. So that is the first aspect. Two, we have the beeswax, which of course most of you know, you have, uh, we, we have seen, we have candles in our houses, they are made out of the beeswax. We have uh, the shoes polish, they use the beeswax. Uh, in making the, the shoes polish, uh, those that we use to in our leather sofa sets, uh, those sprays, they are, there is wax used in there, leaf balms, they are made out of wax. So wax is another, is the second product that we get from the bees and those are the uses. Product number three, we have what we call the bee, uh, we, we have what we call pollen. Pollen is stored and it can be harvested and used as food. And pollen is good uh, for those, if you do some research, it is good for women. Good for women, uh, those especially who have problems uh, with uh, menstrual circles and so on and so forth. Number four, we have what we call the royal jelly. Royal jelly is food meant for the queen. In the other aspect, we have, we, we, you, you know the members of, uh, of, of a bee colony. The queen is the leader. The queen does not feed on anything else. She feeds on the royal jelly. That is why she stays longer. And it is research proves and says that those who take royal jelly, they remain young for a long time. It, it, they don't have wrinkles. 
you know, your skin is well nurtured and, and all that. That is the use of rayo jelly. Then the most expensive product that we have from the bees, it is what we call the bee venom. Now, bee venom is, a, is, is an area, when you, we, if, if you do some research, you'll find that bee venom is seven times more expensive than gold. We have a way that we extract it. We have the bee venom extractors, which has plates and the bees sting. You know, the, when they sting, there is that venom that they, 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 they spew into you. That's the one, especially if you've been stung, it is the one you say you are, react, you, are, you, you are reacting with it, you swell and so on and so forth. That is medicinal. So bee venom basically is used for the medicinal values. One, it's used in the pharmaceutical industries. Uh, top on, on the list on what it heals is arthritis. There are researchers that have, have, have been proven on, on its healing uh, uh, capacities or abilities on cancer, breast cancer. That was a, a research that was done uh, in Australia. AIDS, that is from the, uh, the, the a, a university uh, in Russia, Middle East. They have, they have those scientific uh, uh, findings. And then arthritis, we've, talk, we've spoken about it. Now, that is in the pharmaceutical industry. Now, again, bee venom is used in the cosmetic industries. In the cosmetic industries, we have bee creams, uh, bee venom creams. These creams normally are meant uh, for ladies. They are anti-wrinkles, anti-aging, so they apply their skins. They remain smooth and, you know, because it has the skin repairing properties. Another product that we have is propolis. Propolis is the sticky substance that the bees especially put. Like here, at the entrance, you will find that propolis is put there. That propolis, they use it as a detergent. When bees come in, they have to step on it to disinfect themselves. Sorry, it's a, it's a disinfectant. So they disinfect themselves and then get into the hive. The most safest and cleanest place that, that is ever guarded is the inside of the hive. So that is propolis. Where we have openings and air is coming in, the bees will seal those holes with propolis. Now this propolis is used as medicine. Some people chew, some people process it, and it heals uh, different uh, diseases. Now those are the bee products. Those are the products that we get from the bees. And each of them have different, uh, different ways of harvesting. Welcome, uh, uh, viewer. So now, uh, today, we want to show you some of the bee equipment that uh, we have researched of good quality that we bring to you whenever you need them. You can find them with us. So as you get your hive, because the first step for anyone watching this, the first step is that you must have bought a hive or you have developed an, an idea of beekeeping. Now, once you have that hive, there are other things that you need. A hive alone is not enough. And therefore, when you are going to harvest, or when you are going to inspect your hive before the harvest, there are essential things that you need to have. One, you need to have a bee suit. And we will elaborate to you a good bee suit, how it should be. So you need to have a bee suit, which you can find here with us. This is the one that will protect you uh, from the hostilities of the bees. Because remember, honey is food meant for the bees and we are going to steal from them. As you go to steal from them, there will be a lot of resistance and hostility and therefore you need a good bee suit. Once you have a bee suit, then you also need a good smoker, like the one that we have here. You need a good smoker, you put some sawdust, uh, whatever that you want to use, Inside, put some charcoal, and as you buff it, as you buff it, there'll be smoke coming out. 
Essentially, the importance of this is to confuse them. Once you blow in this mock into the hive, the bees do not communicate. They become docile, they become uh, less hostile, and therefore your harvesting becomes easier. So you need this kind of a, a, a smoker, and this one as somewhere, especially if you are, you're, you're inspecting your hive, you can hang it. You don't need someone to help you. You hang it just on your hive, then you continue doing whatever that you want to do, then you can get it out, buff again, and then hang it. You don't have to look for it, you put it somewhere close to you where you're seeing it. Uh, and then of course, uh, you will need the gloves. We have uh, both the leather and the PVC gloves. These are PVC, uh, PVC gloves uh, to help your hands. So you put them on tightly. So whenever you hold the bees, whenever you're doing your stuff, your hands are safe. Then we have this clip. It is new in the market. And this one helps you when the, when the frame has been tightened by the propolis. When you cannot use the hive tool. Well, you can use the hive tool, but this one makes it a bit easier and faster. So you get your clip, hold on the, on the frame, and then pull it out. Very, very, very effective. Then after that, we also have a bee brush. Pull out your frame, it will be full of bees. Shake it a little bit, just on the hive, and then now you you remove, you remove whichever bee that has remained. Then, then you have now a frame that is free of bees that you're going to take for harvesting or to get honey out of it. So you get your bee brush. A good bee brush is key. Depends on the material that it has been, it has been made of. Um, Sisol, it could be Sisol, but Sisol makes them a little bit aggressive. There are other, other brush, bee brush, that whenever you use them like this, they, 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 they agitate the bees to be more aggressive and more hostile. So ensure you have the best bee brush. Then once you have this, you have the frame, you've gotten it from the hive, now you've come and you want to remove the honey, you will need what we call uncapping comb uncapping fork, sorry, uncapping fork. So this one will help you uncap the frame or the honey. To, in other words, you want to open the pores. You want to open the cells for the honey to come out. So you will, it is easier for you to do it this way. Then once you've finished uh, from here, now this one is, is good and free to go to what we call our centrifuge machine. Get your centrifuge machine, then now put it here. The centrifuge machine that we have is a three and six frame centrifuge machine. Once you have uncapped, now your work is to spin. Now your work is to spin. And once you spin, after some time, you again now turn, you turn the frame, then spin, spin once again. Then after several spins, just check if all the honey is out. Once all the honey is out, you put it aside and get another, an, a, another comb. Now, after this, once the honey is full here, once the honey is full, get it out through the honey gate or the honey valve, you open, Pour it out. Once you pour it out, the next thing that now you will need is what we call a sieve. We have the corn called sieve, but for us here we have what we call a double sieve. Get your double sieve and you have your bucket here. This hand grade bucket, food grade bucket, is also fitted with a with a honey gate. So once you put it there, like that, then now what you do, pour your honey, 
into that. It will pass through the double sieve. Then what you'll get down there is pure honey without any wax, without pollen, without anything. Very fine honey. That is what you'll get there. So this, after that, maybe for those who are doing it for commercial purposes, we have what we call a refractometer. The refractometer, this one, is to test the water content in the honey. If you want to know that your honey is ripe for harvesting, you use the refractometer. Now, we talked of uncapping. How do you uncap? We have what we call uncapping tray, together with uncapping sieve. This one makes it easier for anyone when you are uncapping. Put your frame like this, uncap. You do not lose any honey. Whatever that you are, you are uncapping from here falls here. When it falls here, honey will get, find its way down to our uncapping tray, and then you will get your honey from this end. Honey is so expensive for it to be wasted. So we ensure that you do not waste any honey. We also have a honey warmer. Honey warmer helps to slow down the crystallization process. That is the number one uh, use for it. Especially in the cold seasons, as you know, raw honey crystallizes. So in the cold seasons, it will crystallize faster. So the work of the honey warmer is you heat your honey at 40 degrees. If you go more than 40 degrees, you are going to kill the essential nutrients in the honey. So the honey warmer will help you heat that honey or warm that honey at 40 degrees to slow down the process of crystallization, number one. Number two, if there was any wax as we were spinning, there could be some wax of uh, very small particles that can find its way to the honey, which may also uh, contribute to faster crystallization. When you hit that honey at 40 degrees, uh, 40 degrees, that wax will definitely float and any chaff that could be there will float and you remove it out and get pure, fine, raw honey. Continue watching Envision. We are here for equipments. If you want any equipment for beekeeping, we have done our research. We know the best equipment and at a very affordable price, you'll only find it with us, Miller's Honey and Bee Farm. Thank you and God bless you. Continue watching and following us on Twitter, on Facebook, on uh, Boresha platform, on YouTube channel for this and much more on beekeeping. Thank you so much. Thank you.